A new series brings a new game, and this time the series was bent on Omniverse. If you ask me, this show was the most radically different from UAF and Classic, but at the same time tried to stick to what UAF and Classic already set up. Now, this game is based on the first two seasons of OV, and personally I think those are the most drastically different compared to the rest of the show, as it still feels like it's got a lot of the uh, UAF hangovers. Of course, having the first episode written by Wayne McDuffie himself didn't help those ideas, but... With that being said, the malware arc is one of my favourites as well as feedback, but is the game any good? Let's find out! The plot of this game is a fucking nightmare as it involves time travel, that great classical storytelling medium that definitely hasn't thrown stories out the window. The story begins with Ben and Rook training in the training area of the Plus headquarters, while Blue Kitchen Dreamer attempt to fix the Omnitrix's issue of never giving Ben the right alien. However, while doing this, they accidentally mess with the uh, timing system of the Omnitrix and send Rook five years into the past. When there, Rook comes across young Ben, who is fighting Malware. However, Malware from the past absorbs the Proto Tool, allowing him to change the very essence of any technology he absorbs. This becomes a problem when Rook is sent back to the future and finds out about morphic generators that create holograms. If Malware is able to get his hands on one of these, he's going to be able to change the he's going to be able to change the inert matter itself. Meaning he'll be able to create anything from anything. Obviously, Ben and Rook can't have that. So throughout the story, they try in various ways to stop him. But the eventual plan they come up with is having the malware of the past and the present merge together to erase them both from the timeline. To do this, Rook must travel from the past to the future and must team up with young and present Ben to stop, malwares, stop the malwares and to bring them together, to merge them together to make this never happen. Except from Rook and Ben, who still remember everything. Nobody else does though. So in terms of plot, this plot is fairly simple, yet yeah, it's still complex considering it is a time travel story. Now the reason it's a time travel story is to do with the gameplay, but in terms of how the story is done here, I think it's fine. Yeah, not bad, not good. I think it's just fine. Ben and Rook are written pretty in character, and everybody else who shows up is usually written pretty well in character. But the issue is the story bounces around a lot, and sometimes when Rook time travels, we see, and sometimes when he do does, we don't see. But like I said, the plot does have sort of all around the gameplay. So, what is that gameplay like? So, the gameplay of this game takes more after Perceptor of Earth and Alien Force won the game rather than build back attacks and cosmic destruction. Now, I'd be fine with that if this game wasn't developed by Monkey Bart Games, who also developed Alien Force the game, my least favourite Ben 10 game I've played so far. Now, the big issue with that, with that is that this feels like a game that's built on the backbone of Alien Force the game. However, it does try some new things, like letting you have access to 10 aliens at once. But since both past and present Ben both have their own exclusive aliens, there's 13 aliens this time. The issue is only about 8 of them actually matter to the gameplay, so aliens like Heat Blast and Diamond Head don't do shit. Another issue with the gameplay is that since this gameplay is meant to be multiplayer, you have a partner character in Rook. Oh, Rook's character AI is stupider than me in the third grade. Now, what's the problem with this? Enemies are bullet sponges and require both of you to attack them constantly in order to do any real damage. Special moves drain the special move meter faster than they really should be. And the levels here are extremely long. These levels go on for 40 minutes at a time. And whereas I could excuse them before, I can't excuse them here because there's nothing really going on. There's also a ton of reused assets as the first level shows you about 50% of the assets that are used throughout the entire game. Again, I could excuse this, uh, I get it, the game was rushed out to meet the launch title of the Wii U, something like that. But the issue is that, well, it, it doesn't really make this game stand out as having anything to call its own. It has the plumber base, Bellwood, a construction site, and like two or three other areas, but that's it. And that can make the gameplay feel a lot more repetitive and just boring than it should be. This was something that, uh... This is something that Protector of Earth managed to get away with because of its constant enemy variety. But in this game, there are only about five different variations of enemies. 
There's the malware enemies, the animal enemies, the breedles for some reason, which are just regular enemies, they're not boss fights anymore. Oops. And then other miscellaneous enemies. You can't fill an entire beat em up game with the same five enemies and call it good. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that the gameplay of this game is just fine. I mean, the alien selecting mechanic is a little off since you have to hold a D-pad button to change the alien to whichever one you need. And since some aliens are more useful than others, you want to have a constant stream of the good aliens. But other aliens are more powerful than the ones that you want to use them all, so it's just a whole mess. And again, Rook's character AI is fucking stupid. But I could understand it because this was meant to be a Wii U launch title. And it was very much rushed out to be to be relevant when Omnibus was coming out. Because as we all know, Cartoon Network heavily fucked over Omnibus, but we can get into that in the next game. So, what's the presentation like? Game uh, Presentation-wise, this game's alright. It tries to mimic the OV art style and does a decent enough job at it. And thanks to the constant linear camera that's focused on just Ben and Rock, the game can have a stable frame rate. And any console that isn't the Wii. Because just take a look at the Wii here, it has several issues, like Wildmore having two Omnitrix symbols and Octaguana having multiple Omnitrix symbols at any given time. This is probably an issue of the game was rushed out, because this game was very much rushed, as can be shown in the animation department. Because there are two or three cutscenes with actual animation, and the rest of them just has the same reusing, same reuse of character animations. Again, the game was rushed, I could excuse this if it wasn't for the fact that this was the big new Ben 10 game. And being a launch title for the Wii U definitely didn't help with the other launch titles that are coming out around that time. So, overall, is this a good game? If you ask me, this is, in fact, a game. I know I used that joke in the last episode, let me have this. Being serious here for a minute. This game is one that I just can't be bothered going back to. It isn't like the next one that infuriates me, and it isn't like the other ones that make me really happy. This one just bores me. And, like I said in Alien Falls, that's the worst thing a game can do. Be boring. Because with a bad game, you'll remember it. With a boring game, you'll forget it. And this brings me to my ultimate conclusion of the Monkey Bar trilogy of Ben 10 games that show that they don't get Ben 10 because... It doesn't feel like they do. Alien Force the game was all over the place with st oh, storytelling and the gameplay. Galactic Racing it was a mess of you trying to race Ben's aliens, but also having other characters like Kevin and Vildax there that broke that illusion. And this is just boring. I don't feel like this is a Ben 10 game. I feel like this is a generic 3D beat em up that you could slap Ben 10 in and sell. Who knows, maybe that's what they ended up doing. But. I don't know. At least it's still better than the next game we're gonna take a look at, Benton Omniverse 2. I can say that much, because Omniverse 2 fucking sucks. But we can get there when we get there. Until then, take care. Bye. Hello and welcome back. Today we're gonna to be taking a look at Benton Omniverse The Game 2. Now, Benton Omniverse around this time was the incursion arc. My big problem with the Incursion arc was how the network fucked it over, airing episodes out of order, airing some episodes from like Season 5 and Season 3, airing the finale like four episodes ahead of time, constantly referencing things that didn't happen because of the network, it, it's a whole mess. And this game does not help, like I like the Incursion arc, but I fucking despise this game. Why? Well let's start with that plot and how it's fucking inconsequential. So. What is the plot of this game? There isn't one. No, seriously, the plot of this game is inconsequential. Because of the fact this is a midquel taking place in between Frogs of War Part 1 and 2, there's nothing they can do with this plot to make it interesting. Anything they attempted only caused continuity issues, as proven with the final fucking boss when Dr. Psychobo sees Ben, calls out Ben, but it has never brought up in Frogs of War Part 2 that he even believes Ben is back on the uh, back on Earth. And what really doesn't help with this is, that, is how everybody's written. Asmuth is just a grump and Ben is just a kid. I don't mean this in like, oh, the network decided, nah, make him a kid again. No, I mean this time he is legitimately just a child. He never listens to anything, constantly says like, oh, this is gross. He only comes up with a plan once, constantly wings everything, and I, I just don't like this version of Ben. 
This is Alien Fall Season 3, Ben, and nobody likes that version of Ben. I don't care who you are, no the fuck you don't. And then, like I said, there's the continuity issues this game provides. As we see Bellwood is in ruin. But then it's not the next time we're there, because, like, the level reset? I don't know. Look, the plot of this game is inconsequential at best. At worst, it creates massive continuity errors because this game is meant to be one that's canon to the story. This is meant to explain what happens in between Frogs of War 1 and 2 to explain how Ben got Bullfrag. But that's all it does. And it explains that in the third fucking level of the game. So, what's that gameplay like? So, what is the gameplay? Let's take a look. This game is an infinite runny game. Fine, I'll do the damn review. This game is an infinite runner game where you get to play it as either a light class alien, a medium class alien, or a heavyweight alien. A light class alien is fast but doesn't carry much strength. A medium class alien is long ranged, and that's about it. And a heavy class alien is able to destroy things really well but it moves so slow I never fucking use them. Now, why is this game an infinite runner? It's the same reason why it reuses assets every 5 seconds. Because this game was rushed out the door. This game was probably made in like 6 months. Which is the less time than I bet the episode itself got. But hey, gotta make that money while we can, right? No! This game is fucking awful gameplay wise. Like, I thought Omniverse was uh, one, and Alien Force the game had it better when it came to the combat. This game is fucking hopeless. You get maybe one combo, unless you start to actively upgrade the aliens. But to do that, you need to explore the game. But it's hard to explore the game when it's hard to tell where you've been and where you haven't, because everything looks the damn same! Oh, but don't, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. Because what I'm showing you right now, I'm going to show you level 1 and level 2. You see how they're the exact fucking same? Or how about you start Bell the three Bellwood levels the exact same way? Or how even at the end of the game they're still reusing assets from levels 1 and 2? Or how... Hell, I forgot to mention this beforehand, but the continuity of this game makes no fucking sense. Because they explain that Ben has to get the biggest and strongest incursion DNA, when that's not how that works at all. God damn, did anybody who worked on the show even glance at this game? Like seriously, a single person, I would take anybody who even worked on the show even take a single glance at this game during development. But what makes all this worse is that it's fucking High Voltage who made this, who made Protector of Earth. My favorite Ben 10 game. And they can't do this, right? Hell, did you guys know this game got a Wii version? That's right, a fucking Wii version? Yeah, and somehow it's still it's still it's still less bad than the OV Wii version, I'll give it that. But hey, you know, I just I fucking despise this game. There's no other way of saying it. This game is fucking awful. And I'm sorry for all the swearing and shouting, but I cannot review this game lightly. So, is this game good? But fucking course it isn't! There is so much wrong with this game from just the design stage. Look, you can give me the excuse of, oh, this game was rushed out all you want, but that isn't going to change the fact this game, it's just terrible. Like, I'm glad the show got rebooted if it means this was no longer the final game. Speaking of the reboot, that got two games as well. So, next time, join us when we look at the first game from the reboot series, Ben 10. And until then, take care. Bye, and never play this game in your life. Do not buy this game. <laughs>
Now, this first season of the Bebo is an absolute mess. Everything from the animation being all wonky, to the character writing being inconsistent, to there being very clearly being some holdovers from the original series. This rings even more true for the game we're going to talk about today, because there were a lot of issues with this game that felt like this game was being made so early in production they didn't have finalised ideas for the series. But to do that we should get into the game. So let's start with the plot. The plot of the game is as simple as it's just a six episode mini arc of the, of the reboot. It starts with some balls are draining the energy out of the town, then Gos beats the shit out of him, then he has to stop Queen Bee who's decided to kidnap people for her own amusement to make them sit and watch her show even if they fucking hate it. Once Ben beats her, then he has to go stop the Weatherheads as they are attempting to destroy the world once again. This plot's very simple and feels like it came from the reboot, but it also feels like it's just like a six episode mini arc that they may have wanted to do in the reboot but decided, eh, we'll do it for the game. Now when it comes to the character writing, well I think Ben is fairly on character. Grandpa Max is kind of a hit and miss because he barely shows up, then again I guess that is pretty accurate to the reboot. But Gwen is interesting because she's written as if she's from the original series a lot of the time. You know, poking fun at Ben, making fun of him, that kind of stuff that Reboot Gwen doesn't really do. As for the villains, they are written as if they were the villains from the Reboot, I'll give them that. Although the villains they chose could have been a little better. Like sure, Zombos is a classic, whatever. But Queen Bee is just not a threat. There's a reason why the reboot kind of just dumped her after a season. Like, I think she appears like twice after season one. Mm -hmm. And then the Weatherheads, it's contradictory because in season four of the reboot we learn about uh, the manager, Sunny. But here we see Weatherhead Prime. But Weatherhead Prime is meant to be canon, so I don't know what's going on. As for how the game plays, because this is a game after all, the gameplay is... There's no other way of saying it, the gameplay is just Protector sort of Earth again. Which, since Omnibus managed to fuck up and so did Alien Force, I should be saying this game fucked up too, right? I don't think it did. While the levels are long, so no I saw a free pass on that, it does allow you to play as 10 aliens at once, all 10 from the first season of the reboot. Each alien does have a unique quality to them, and while some aliens like Upgrade and Accelerate are never needed to finish the game, that's fine because they give you all the aliens like in a set order. You start with three, then you get two, then two, then one, then one, and then none in the final level. The game doesn't explain why all the aliens are locked away in this whole ultimate mechanic, which just feels like them poking fun at Ben's an ultimate alien more than anything. But, you know, it's it's fine as a screen nuke. For beat em up for kids, screen nukes pretty acceptable. Now playing this on Switch, there is this weird thing where I can't use my pro controller. I don't know what it is, but I can't. And honestly, that's all I've got to say about this game. The game's only about three hours long, in fact I was able to get through it all in one stream while Ruby was there. But yeah, that's it. So I guess join me next time for when we take a look at uh, Ben 10 Power Trip, the better of the two reboot games. Until then, take care. Bye! The third season of the Ben 10 reboot might be just one of my favourite seasons of Ben 10 overall, just due to the fact of how airtight it is, unlike other seasons such as Alien Force Season 2 where I had a few duds in there. I don't believe the third season of the reboot really has that many duds. And while it does have a few, the 40 episode count makes up for it. To go along with this, Ben 10 Power Trip is probably one of my favourite games of the Ben 10 franchise just due to how experimental it is. However, to get into that, we really should start with the plot. So what's the plot like? Well, the plot starts with Ben, Gwen and Grandpa on their European vacation from Season 3. Nice when a Hex shows up with a power crystal. With said power crystal, he's able to knock the aliens right out of the Omnitrix. However, he leaves behind a tablet, and while Gwen deciphers that, then goes, or goes all around Strudelbeck, the location for this game, helping out the townspeople 
and well, just the folk in general, as well as trying to regain his aliens to take on to take on Hex. Now there are four main locations for this game: the park, the two cities, and the mountains. With each location, you meet a new set of characters, being such as Ranger Ryan, who I think is neat, the reporter lady, who definitely should have been in the reboot, and. Now, the three locations also play into the gameplay, as you have six aliens you can play as. Sure, a downgrade from the 10 of the last game, but Season 3 of the reboot had like five different strength aliens, so I don't mind that only six of them are playable. However, those playable aliens are, first up is Heat Blast 2, you can double jump and have long-lasting burn damage. After that, it's Forearms, who is strong and can pull blocks. After that is Accelerate, who is a fast boy, which is great for an open world game. After that is Shock Rock, who can power up machinery, leap across the buildings with a single lasso, and make me question Wildvine's integrity. After that is R no, I'm not gonna say it. is Wrath. He's acrobatic, the strongest alien in combat, and can boost himself even more by screaming. It's awesome. Finally is Diamond Head, who can create shields, shoot out projectiles, and glide. I think this is a really good balance of the aliens, because each alien feels like they have something to do while not outclassing the other except from forearms. Again, they can never get forearms right, what the fuck? <laughs> now as for how the open world plays, when you're in missions and in the towns, it's great, but when you're getting from place to place, it shows why low budget open world games usually never work. There's nothing to do outside of a few battle quests. And that kind of defeats the whole point of an open world, because a big open world is supposed to make you want to explore, but there's nothing to explore here. Another good section of these games, though, is the Void sections, also known as the Reboot's Ledger Domain. I will fight you on this. The Void sections are tests of pure skill. When you first get all the aliens, it's, you know, just testing out the aliens, but the Void... Well, the Void test at the end, where you have to combine multiple aliens together? really like that, except from the Diamond Head and Heat Blast one, because I kind of skipped most of it, oops. As for the music, it's there, and that kind of thing, it's there, goes for the, pres the whole presentation. Because this game has a serious issue with uh, low textures a lot of the time, low textures, humans reused over and over again, and I wouldn't be that upset with that, to be honest. But I am playing the PS5 version. I didn't even know they made a native PS5 version until the other week. But the PS5 version seems to have some issues with frame rates and picking up items, because every time you pick up items, the game has to just stop to actually pick up the item. It's weird. I know it isn't like this on Switch or PS4, so what's going on here? Best guess, it was probably rushed out because this game came out in late 2020. Around the same time as Versus the Universe, actually. I think it was being promoted as being for Versus the Universe when it's the Season 3 Omnitrix on Benjurist. Anyway, another cool feature about this game is that Kevin is playable as Player 2. This finally solves the issue of how do we have two playable characters in a Ben 10 game? Because to be frank with you, not a, nothing has worked beforehand. Sets of Earth and Alien Force both had just a second player spawning who was just Ben. And Omniverse just had a Rook who was not as good as Ben. And then Omniverse 2 kept it limited to arena challenges where if nobody was powered in, it was Rook. But if somebody, somebody joins in the game, it's just another Ben again. But hey, at least here it's good, because Kevin has Hotshot, Quad Smack, Rush, Thornblade, Bashmouth, and Crystal Fist. I think these aliens work pretty well as substitutes. Only one be only exception being uh, 
Thornblade and the Shockrock. Because now Thornblade is powering up electronics. I don't remember Wildvine doing that, but I could be misremembering things. However, that could have just been fixed by giving him Bootleg instead of uh, Thornblade. No, that wouldn't even have been correct because Shockrock replaced replaced upgrade in, the, in uh, Season 2. As for the combat, while well, very simplistic, I think it works what the game's going for. There are combos, but it's just press press light attack until heavy attack. But that's fine with the variety you get from the six aliens, and I like that they don't even keep Ben out of the loop, because while he can't fight, he has his scooter, which is great early game when you don't have Accelerate. Too bad it's an open world game and you can go get Accelerate immediately. So, overall, what do I think of this game? I really do like it. But there are so many obvious flaws that I can't say it's the best one ever made. That's probably still going to protect the Earth. Or Cosmic Destruction, you guys pick. Anyway, this brings the Ben 10 series to a close, shut up. So, what's next? Uh, next time I think I'm just going to cover a smaller release. But, until then, take care. Bye!